happy Father's Day to every father out there, every father that's watching today, whether you're catching the YouTube replay or you're watching this on Facebook. Um, we want to say happy Father's Day to all of you. This is a special day because fathers are essential. Um, we're in quarantine and, you know, the government is talking about essential and non-essential businesses. I want to let all the fathers know that you are essential to life and you are essential to our well-being. So big up to all the fathers. And um, if I could give you a pound, I'd give you a pound. If I could dab you up, I would dab you up. But we're excited about the word of God. If you're excited about the word of God today, put it in the chat. Let's blow up the chat today. Let's blow up the comments and let's have a great interactive Sunday. Um, put Happy Father's Day in the chat. But I'm, I'm excited for the word in the chat because we're about to jump into the word of God. Let's go to Luke chapter six. And I'm going to be reading from verses 46 to verse 49. From verse 46 to verse 49 of the book of Luke. I'm going to read out of the New King James Version. It says this, but why do you call me Lord, Lord? and not do the things which I say. Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. The word of God is nourishment for our soul and our spirit today. Today is Father's Day. I would like to speak from this subject ruin. Uh, put it in the comment section. Pastor is preaching about ruin. Fathers are essential. Fathers are important. And today we ought to celebrate fathers everywhere. We ought to uh, pat a father on the back. We ought to encourage a father because fathers are critical. And I, when I was praying about what to share with you today, God led me to this scripture um, that we may extrapolate some truth about Jesus and about what he was saying, because we're in the midst of a sermon series entitled, What Would Jesus Say? What Would Jesus Say? And I asked, I asked the Lord some questions about fathers, and he, he showed me some things in this text. The first thing that I want to talk about um, as it relates to this parable this brief parable that Jesus talks about is Jesus is comparing and contrasting two men that build houses. And the first house, the first man that builds this house, the Bible says he digs down and he lays the foundation on the rock and the storm comes and the, the house is able to withstand the storm. But the second man who builds his house, he builds it on the earth without a foundation. It's not built on the rock. And when the storm comes, it, it demolishes that house. And, I, and when I looked at that text, the, the first thing that I see in this parable is that Jesus is obsessed with the process. If you're taking notes, I need you to write that down. I need you to put it in the comments. Jesus is obsessed with the process. He, he, he is obsessed with the process because he is not explaining to us and giving us the details of what the houses look like. He does not tell us how many windows are in each house. He does not tell us the color of each house in this parable. He does not tell us whether the houses have a front door or a back door. But Jesus is not concerned so much about what the house looks like, 
He is concerned about the process. And Jesus begins to compare and contrast how these two men go about building a house. And what I learned out of that and and what struck me is that God is so preoccupied with the process because he understands that the process brings about the end result. The process will always lead you to a desired outcome. And Jesus will often show us the process and bring us through the process, and he won't give us great detail about the outcome. It's as almost it's almost as if God is obsessed with the process. The Bible that you read and the Bible that I read speaks more about the process than it does about the outcome. I mean, 90% of the Bible gives information, it gives insight to the process of life, how we should live our lives, how we should walk in the fear of the Lord, and how we should govern ourselves and interact and engage with people. But there is little uh, instruction, there is little detail about what happens if we work through that process. There's little detail about the outcome, about heaven. Heaven is is a mystery to us. We know some details about heaven, and I know there are some scriptures that refer to heaven, but by and large, we do not know the great intricacies about heaven because God is obsessed with the process. If you don't believe me, ask our friend Job. Ask Job and all that he went through and all that he lost and 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 try and tell Job that God is not obsessed with the process. If you don't believe me, then maybe you should knock on the door of Abraham and how God called Abraham out of his homeland and said that he should go to a land that was a mystery a land that he did not have great details about, an unknown land, and that God would make him the father of a great nation. And the fact that it took God 25 years to give him the son of promise, that he had to walk through a great process in order to receive his desired outcome. Try and tell Abraham that God is not a God of process. And and as I look at the Bible that we read, I am convinced that God is a God of process. You need to embrace your process. You need to walk in your process. When I consider the book of Genesis, the book of the beginnings, and how God blessed Adam, and how God made promises to Adam, when Adam fell into sin, God could have immediately redeemed Adam. He could have immediately um, caused Adam to fall into the fullness of redemption. But instead of God instantaneously redeeming Adam, he walks Adam through a process. In fact, he walks mankind down the long road of a process called redemption. Uh, he makes a promise to Eve in the in their fall. He makes a promise to Eve and he says that the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head. And God does not fulfill that promise until we see Jesus on the cross thousands of years later. You can't convince me that God is not a God that is preoccupied with the process. Instead of coming to the aid, instead of redeeming Adam in that moment, he he causes mankind to walk down this road that we call a process. And he, he brings about Noah and Noah is born and Noah builds an ark because it's about a process. And he he causes 
the children of Israel to be birthed out of the loins of Abraham and Abraham leads to Jacob and Jacob leads to Joseph and Joseph leads to Moses and Moses leads to Joshua and Joshua leads to the period of judges and the period of judges turns into the period of Samuel and Samuel anoints Saul as king and now the nation of Israel is under the kingdom rule and you can't tell me that God is not a God of process. So when we look at our text today, what leaps out into my spirit is that God is about process. And if we do not embrace the correct process, then we will not find our desired outcome. I need somebody to type that word process in the comment section because it's essential. And being a dad, I've learned a lot about process. And I'm thinking about my kids. And I have two kids, Isabella and Caleb. Um, and they both are a lover of Legos. I, 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 am, I am glad that they're a lover of Legos because I have an architectural background and I have an architectural mind. Um, sometimes they're a lover of Legos too much. Because, you know, you walk into their room and then you're stepping all over these Legos. <laughs> you're walking through the hallway and you're, you know, crushing your toe and squeezing your foot on all of these Legos. And, and I decided to bring some Legos today um, because I believe Legos gives a little bit of an analogy as it relates to our text when Jesus is talking about how to build. And I love Legos. Because Legos are great. I mean, Legos allow kids to learn about building and learn about erecting. And I have some Legos here today. Um, but one of the things that bothers me about Legos is that Legos, they actually give us great insight into how to build up and how to connect things and build it up. But one of the principal things about building that Legos fail, I believe, fail to really give great insight and learning towards is, is what happens beneath the soil, what happens beneath the foundation. And it almost as, it's almost as if it, it teaches us to build incorrectly because we're so concerned with building up. It's, it's like we give no thought to the foundation. And when you build up, but have no concern about what happens beneath the foundation or what happens beneath the soil, your building is liable to collapse. And, and could it be that we find ourselves building careers, building our purpose, building our goals and our aspirations, and we're so concerned with building up that we're actually building in the wrong direction. And Jesus is, a, is, is so concerned with process because he wants us to understand how critical it is that we build in the right direction first. That we don't build as if we're building Legos, but we build as if we're trying to build something that will last. And, and I'm calling on all the builders today, everybody that believes you have a purpose, you have a destiny, and that you're called to build something. If you are called to build something great, I need you to put in the comment section that I am a builder. I need you to type that out, put it in the comments. I am a builder. And if you are a builder, you have got to get this point that I'm about to drop. That, that if you're going to build something that will last, you have got to go down first. You cannot go up first. You have got to go down first. In other words, I want to ask you this question. 
Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Because Jesus, he, 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 he explains that the man who builds the house correctly, he begins to dig first. He begins to excavate the soil and unearth the soil because he knows the correct direction in which he must build. Because the excavation period or stage is so critical to what God wants to build in your life. I know that in this culture and in this society, everybody is building up. Everybody's building a business. Everybody's building a career. Everybody's building a family. Everybody's building their goals and their aspirations. And if you're not careful, you will be so captivated by what people are building, what you can see, that you are missing what you can't see. That 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 you are also actually missing the stage that is the most critical to what you are supposed to be building in this season. And I want to uh, drop this word on somebody today that this is your digging season. This is not your erecting season. This is not your um, a building season. This is not the season for you to build up. This is the season for you to dig down. This is your digging season because somebody needs to dig until they hit the rock. Somebody needs to dig until they find God in this season. Somebody needs to dig until you find the Lord and Savior of your life. Somebody needs to dig down until you find the joy of your salvation. Somebody needs to dig until you find the peace that passes all understanding and quarantine is actually your digging season. It's not your promotion season. It's not your uh, your your um coming out season. It's not the season where the lights are shined on your life. But if you would look at what God is trying to do in your life right now, I want you to see that this is your digging season. God wants you to go down. He wants you to dig into the depths of his glory. He wants you to dig into the depths of his purpose. And we have been so consumed with what people are building up. And we have forgotten the necessary stage of building down and digging down and finding God beneath the soil, finding God in the dark places. Because if we don't go down, then God cannot build us up. This is your digging season. Put it in the comment section. This is your digging season. I, I know people are hating on you right now because it looks like you're not building anything. It looks like you're not going anywhere. It looks like you're not progressing and moving forward. But you need, the next time somebody comes to you and is questioning what's going on in your life right now, you need to tell them, don't worry about it. It's my digging season. Don't worry about it. I I'm digging into the depths of God because God is about to do something so great in your life that you have got to go down first before you go up. You see, the kingdom principle is that you must go down before you can go up. You must go down in humility before God can raise you up. The Bible says in the book of Peter that God despises the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And and I believe our culture is so pre is so is so consumed. We are so overwhelmed with pride 
that all we want to do is build up. All we want to do is show what we can do, show the businesses that we can create, show the money that we can make. But the kingdom principle is that you have got to go down first before you can go up. The Bible also says that you must humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he will exalt you in due time. And maybe God God is not raising you up right now because he needs to humble you. He needs to humble you in your money, humble you in your marriage, humble you in your emotions. God wants to dig out something great in your life. He, he, he wants to dig out something powerful in your life. The next thing that I notice about this text, I wonder if y'all with me today. If you're with me, put it in the comment section. Say, Pastor, I'm with you today. Um, the, the, the second thing that I notice about how Jesus compares and how he contrasts these two men that are building their respective houses is that something happens to both houses. The Bible says, that a storm arises and the storm beats so vehemently, so forcefully against the house that the first house, because it's founded and it's grounded and it's stabilized against the rock, the first house does not fall. But the second house, because it doesn't have a foundation and it's not founded on the rock, it is condemned. It falls to the ground. And what I notice in this text is that the storm is inevitable. Somebody put that in the chat. Storms are inevitable. Whether you're saved or unsaved, you will go through a storm. Whether you love God or you don't love God, you will go through a storm. Whether you're an atheist or a Christian, you will go through a storm. The, the Bible says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. As long as you are living, you will experience storms. But the difference between the believer and the unbeliever, the difference between the person that is grounded in God and the person that has no foundation and their house is not built on the rock, the difference between the two is that one house will fall and the other house will stand. And, and the problem today with Christians is that we are so judgmental. We are so judgmental that we have lost all level and semblance of discernment. And, and we look at the house we can see and we forget to look at what's beneath the soil, and we walk around judging all of these houses, all of these lives that we see, all of what we see in society, and we judge whether or not people are secure in God based on the house that we see, and we fail to look at the foundation that we can't see. And the determining factor, whether or not something is built to last, whether or not somebody's life is really grounded in Christ is not what the house looks like, but whether or not they have built their house on the rock. And we have got to step out and we have got to stop judging people based on what we see, because the storm is the great equalizer. The storms of life, they are the great equalizer. What do you do when a storm comes in your life? I, I am able to tell how grounded you are in Christ based on what happens when the storm rocks your life, when the storm rocks your existence, when the storm rocks your finances. What do you do? What happens to you when the storm comes? If you're able to still have a praise 
then your house is built on the rock. I need somebody to testify with me today. If you are still here and you are still living, even though you've gone through a storm, I need you to give God a praise today. I need you to say, thank you, Lord, in the chat. I need you to say, thank you, Jesus, in the chat. The fact that you are still here today is an indication of how your house is built. The fact that you still can worship God, the fact that you can still lift your hands, the fact that you can still give God a praise is a testament to the fact that you are grounded and rooted on the rock because the storm is inevitable. The storm is inevitable. And as I was praying and looking to God today for, for what I should say to fathers, I, I, I asked Jesus this question because we're in we're in a sermon series, and the title of the sermon series is, What Would Jesus Say? And I asked God, what would you say about fatherhood in the 21st century? What do you have to say about what fatherhood looks like in the 21st century? And, and what I felt in my spirit and, and what I gleaned from this text is one word, and that word is ruin. Ruin. Because when I compare and when I contrast these two houses, the major difference that we all see in the text is that one house was built on the rock and the other house was built on the earth. But I saw another difference that stood out to me. Jesus says that the first house was built with a foundation and that foundation was built on the rock. The second house was built with no foundation. And as I began to, to really press in the spirit, God just began to speak to me about the condition of the world today, the condition of our nation today, the condition of the culture today, that perhaps we are building houses, we are building families, we are building communities, we are building ecosystems, we are building cities without foundation. And I, and I know that the theological understanding of this text is that when you build your house on the rock, your house will stand. But I want to critically ask somebody today, what happens when you build a house without a foundation? I, 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 know, I know that the rock is the most important component of this text. But have we overlooked the importance of foundation? Because God began to show me that every ecosystem, every culture, every society is built upon the family. And if the family is structured correctly, then the community works. If the family is united, then the city works, the neighborhood works. Everything comes out of the epicenter of the family. But I am concerned that we are building families without a foundation. That the foundation of the family is the father. The foundation of the family is the father. And fathers are an endangered species. Can I talk to the men today? 
Fathers are an endangered species. And it's as if our culture is beginning to move on and, and, and beginning to do life without fatherhood, as if fatherhood is expendable, is negotiable, is inconsequential. It's as if we don't need father anymore because we are building all of these systems to be successful without fathers. We are building all of these structures to be, to be prominent and to be robust and to be stable without fathers. But, but the enemy of our souls is hit to the game. He understands how essential fathers are to a society. He understands how essential men are to a society. And, and, and I wonder if our culture is swinging too far to an, a, to an extreme where we have empowered one gender to the detriment of another. Now, now, ladies, I love you. Women, I love you. Women, we need more of you. Women, we need to go to bat for you more. We need more female CEOs. We need more female business owners. We need more females in ministry. We need more females in leadership. We need more females at the boardroom table. But what I'm concerned about is that we don't empower one gender to the detriment of the other. That we don't start to feel as if we don't need men anymore. That we don't value men anymore. Do you know, do you know, do you know that suicides are more common among men than they are among women. That the adjusted, uh, that the age adjusted suicide rate in 2018 was 14.2 per 1,000 individuals. That means that the suicide rate was very high. Um, and, and did you know that in 2018, men died by suicide 3.5 times more often than women. Do you know that a man is three and a half more time, three and a half times more likely to end his life via suicide than women? And 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 could that be because we are we are erecting houses, we are erecting ministries, we are erecting purpose, we are erecting businesses, we are erect, erecting communities without foundations. Can I speak to the men today? Because I want to empower a man today. I want to empower a man to know. I want to let you know that you are valuable, you are vital, you are needed. You are essential. We need more men in our communities. We need more men in our neighborhoods. We need more men leading in education. We need more men to take up responsibility because the enemy is after men. And when I survey the typography of the culture, all I see are are ruins. I see ruins in our cities. I see ruins in our neighborhoods because we are building all of these things without men. I need somebody to back me up in the comment section today that 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 we are erecting all of these movements to to isolate and to disintegrate the value of men.
Ha, we, we are erecting all of these mindsets to say a man is not needed. In fact, science and technology is advancing to the rate and to the place now where we don't even need men to procreate. That, that, that men are so indispensable. That, that I want to let a man know today that you are more than a baby making machine that you have more value to society and culture than making babies. I want to pour responsibility into a man to let you know that you are critical, that if we don't build on your shoulders, then the house has the potential to fall because the foundation is laid on the rock. And, 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 and our women are left in a place today where, where they have no choice but to do it by themselves. Can I raise up a man to say today that you are critical? I want to pour into a man to say today that your voice is needed, uh, that, that we need you. Hallelujah. We need you in our churches. We need you in our families. I, I want to come against the spirit of absenteeism. I want to come against the spirit of the age that, that wants to create systems that erase and eradicate men out of society. I want to come against the spirit of mass incarceration that wants to cripple the backs, that wants to cripple the vision and the purpose of African-American men. I want to come against the spirit of the age that wants to extrapolate men, good men, out of their families, out of their homes, out of their jobs, out of opportunities. Can I come against the devil today? Because when I look at the land, I see houses that have been dilapidated. I see houses that have been demolished demolished and all I see are ruins. Can I get a sister to back me up? Can I get a sister to put a comment in, in the comment section and say, we need men. We need men to step up. We need men to build businesses. We need men to take care of their families. We need men to take responsibility. We need men because men are essential. Essential. And if we don't have men, if we continue down this road, all we will find is that our communities are decimated and they are left in ruins. We need a man to step up and be a mentor. We need a man to step up and adopt a child. We need a man. I feel God right here in this moment because men are essential. We have societies. We have people that have been left in ruins because they have been hurt by a man. They have been hurt by a father. They have been abused by a father or they have been left abandoned by a father. Can I speak to somebody's plight today? Can I speak to the ruins in your heart today? Can I speak to the ruins of your life today? Because you are so broken. You are broken today and your business isn't working and your career isn't working and your marriage isn't working because on the inside you are left in ruins. You are left in ruins because of the foundation or the lack of a foundation or the crack in a foundation and the enemy has sent a storm in your life and you and your house has been dilapidated. It has been disintegrated integrated and you are broken emotionally. You are abandoned emotionally because the foundation was not laid. Can I build this thing right today? Can I come against the spirit of the age that wants to leave us in ruins? Maybe we would have better relations in our society if men would get their act together and get in order. Maybe we would have 
a better community today if the foundation was laid. And what I see in this text is that the man that built his house on the earth, number one, he didn't build it on the rock, but number two, there was no foundation. Hallelujah. There was no foundation. There was nothing there to keep the house, uh, to keep the house stabilized when the storm came. And, and, and we need, we need men. We need the foundation. We need a man that would stand up and step up and say, I'm here. I've got shoulders. I've got strong shoulders. You can build this thing on me. I, I, we need men to stay, not to leave, but stay when the storm hits. You know, this past week was my birthday. And <clears throat> this year, I got the best birthday present than I've ever gotten because as I get older I'm starting to appreciate certain things I'm starting to appreciate fatherhood manhood and growing into what God has called me to be and I'm a gadget guy all, all, all the guys that love gadgets Put it in the chat. If you're a gadget guy, if you love, if you love the latest phone, or if you love <clears throat> the latest technology, or if you love TVs, or or if you love gadgets, put it in the chat. I'm a gadget guy, and, and so I love getting a new iPad. I, I love getting a new Apple Watch. I love getting a new phone. I love getting that big screen TV. I I even love getting a new pair of Jordan. But this year, I got the best gift. My wife, she, she didn't buy me a new pair of Jordans. She didn't buy me a new phone. She didn't buy me a new iPad. She didn't buy me a new computer. She wrote down, because I turned 38 this year, she wrote down 38 things that I love about you. And when I read that there is somebody out there that loves 38 things about me as a person and as a man, I understood in that moment how critical it is for men to feel valued. I understood as I get older how critical it is for me to hear that I am needed, that I am worth something. I don't know your situation today, whether your father is present, whether your father is absent, or, or whether you were hurt by your father or what happened to you. I don't know your circumstance or your situation. But what I need you to do today so that we can fix this epidemic that I call the ruin, I, I need you to encourage a man today. I need you to encourage a father today. Find a cousin that's a father and tell him he's valuable. Call your father up and tell him he's valuable. Find your brother. Reach out to him. Tell him he's valuable. Talk to your son. He's a father and tell him he's valuable. Find an uncle. Tell him he's valuable. Because I see in the spirit a land filled with ruin. And we need, if we're going to fix what's going on, if we're gonna solve certain problems and certain issues, we need men, we need fathers, we need the foundation. Because if the foundation is not connected to the rock, 
then the whole house is liable to fall. I want to call somebody to a place of prayer today. A place of prayer for the ruins that you are experiencing in your life. Can I call a man, a father to prayer today because of the weight that you are carrying on your shoulders and you feel like you can't handle, you feel like you want to run, you feel like you want to take off, you want to feel like you need to get away. I want to pray. I want us to pray with you today. If you're a father and you need prayer today, if you're a man and you need prayer today, put it in the chat, put prayer. <clears throat> if you have experienced ruins in your life, I need you to put it in the chat today. Any level of brokenness, whether you're a male or a female, this is a sermon today about ruins, about brokenness. Hallelujah. God, Jesus said he is called to heal the brokenhearted. And I believe we have a ministry at Link Church where we are called to heal the brokenhearted, the ruins down beneath the soil of your soul. I want to pray for everybody today because I believe <clears throat> that God wants to heal our hearts. He wants to heal our minds. He wants to heal our emotions. And, and, and God is working it out. He's working it out. He's working it out. He's working it out. He's working it out. Let us let us bow our heads in this moment. God, we thank you today. We give you glory. We praise you. Because God, my heart is broken today when I consider the vastness of the ruins that lie all in our communities, that lie in our streets, that lie in our cities, that, that lie in our culture, that lie in our society. I pray, God, that you would do something special today. That, God, you, you would rebuild our families, rebuild the family structure in America, rebuild the family structure in our neighborhoods. We need fathers, God. We, we need men. And I pray that you would rebuild it according to your word. You would cause a great uprising of men, a great uprising of fathers in this generation. I pray, God, for every person that is listening right now that has experienced hurt, that has experienced condemnation, that has experienced guilt, that has experienced brokenness. I pray, God, that you would heal, that you would soothe, that you would comfort. The God of all comfort, I pray that you would wrap your arms around us right now. I pray, God, that you would not leave us comfortless. You would not leave our lives in ruin. But, God, you would rebuild us, that you would construct us and renovate us according to your plan, according to your purpose, and according to your will. We thank you today, God. We give you glory. We praise you because you are unbelievable, you are insurmountable, and you are perfect. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today for our worship experience. We are so excited that we've been able to connect with you on this platform. To make sure that you don't miss anything that's going on while Link is exclusively online, please be sure to visit our website, linkchurchnc.org, or be sure to follow us on all social media platforms so that you don't miss a beat. Always, we know that what's really important is walking out your purpose with Jesus Christ. If you have decided to give your life to Jesus Christ during any of our broadcasts, be sure to leave that in the comment section so that we know that you've decided to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life and so that we can connect with you and give you some more information. If you don't want to leave your name in the comments, you can also visit linkchurchnc.org and there will be ways for you to connect with us there as well. We are so excited about this decision that you've made 
to follow Christ. We'll see you next time.